Welcome. What you said about your Korean background reminds me a lot of what my daughter-in-law of 45 years has said. And if I learned anything from Korean people, it's a hard work ethic and how you can make a lot out of nothing. So I congratulate you and your people. Thank you. I've asked a number of nominees about judicial philosophy. Some nominees aren't prepared to talk about their approach or won't admit that they have a judicial philosophy. You've been a federal judge since 2010, 11 long years, so I'm hoping you can have a productive conversation with me. Uh, when it comes to describing your judicial philosophy today, would you say that you are an originalist or a textualist, or how would you want to describe your judicial philosophy? So I, I do look at the text first anytime I'm asked to interpret a statute or a constitution, uh, constitutional provision. I do look to precedent from the Supreme Court as to what methods of interpretation they have used for that particular question. Uh, so in some instances, like in Heller, like in Crawford, the Supreme Court said, yes, you look at the original understanding, you look at original sources. And so I follow the Supreme Court precedent when they have analyzed something to see how did they analyze it? What is the method that they use? And then I try to use the exact same, same method every time. You are a district judge handling Tandon versus uh, Newsom. This was a case where two Californians wanted to hold Bible studies and prayer meetings in their home. The COVID rules in California prevented them from holding indoor gatherings, even though California made exceptions for other gatherings, like, just as an example, in-home filming. When you ruled against these plaintiffs, you wrote that they had, quote, little case law to support them, end of quote, in their argument that they were treated differently and unfairly. When the Supreme Court reviewed this case, the, uh, the court reversed it. The court called it unsurprising, that's their word, that the plaintiffs were entitled to host uh, Bible studies at home because California's COVID law, quote, contained myriad exceptions and accommodations for comparable activities, end of quote. The court concluded by saying that strict scrutiny, quote, is not watered down. It really means what it says, end of quote. So my question has to do with the standard of view. You applied Smith's rational basis review to the free exercise issues in this case. Now the Supreme Court has decided a lot of free exercise cases in the last 20 years. Can you name any Supreme Court case decided in the last 20 years where Smith controlled the outcome of the case? I actually used both rational basis and strict scrutiny in tandem, and I relied on the precedent of the Ninth Circuit and the Supreme Court that existed at the time. And at that time, the precedent concerned houses of worship and whether the capacity limits of the houses of worship were actually considered. And there wasn't any precedent at that time of having gatherings inside at the home. And at that time, I relied on the precedent and the Sixth Circuit had a decision that had the same rationale that I adopted that said, if there is a rule that doesn't call out religion, because all of the other cases to that point had called out houses of worship specifically. And this one was a, what I thought, I understand, that the Supreme Court disagreed, and that is the law of the land, and I, I understand. I do my best, but I don't always get it right. But okay. they had said in the Sixth Circuit, and the Supreme Court did not enjoin the Sixth Circuit's decision, that if there is a neutral and generally applicable rule that applies to all schools, it does not call out religious schools, it does not call out public schools, all schools, that is a neutral and generally applicable rule that can withstand scrutiny. And so at that time that I made my decision, that was the law, and I did my best to follow it. 